Welcome to the Twinkle Talks EYFS podcast. Working in the early years is busy, funny, messy and exhausting. Join me, Shana, some of the Twinkle EYFS team, special guest speakers and other early years practitioners as we talk honestly about our experiences. Whether you're listening for CPD, on your commute or to help you relax, Twinkle EYFS will share everything you need to know about all things early years. Hello and welcome to another episode of Twinkle Talks EYFS. We're the private early years team. My name's Katie. And I'm Charlotte. I'm Fliss. And I'm Hannah. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about your practitioner problems. So these have been submitted to us on social media and we're going to give you our advice and experience ourselves. So the first question we've had to come in today is what methods or strategies do you use to improve daily routines at your setting? I guess I'll go for this from like a baby room perspective. So like when I'm in the baby room, you've kind of got to think not only about your daily routine, but also like the baby's routines in terms of naps and sleep. So one thing um, they do in my current setting is on the big board and they've got like the initials of each baby and on there they've wrote down their routine by like time and what they need so like their bottles their naps and how how much they have and what how long they normally sleep and that's really useful when someone else is in the room and also just like double checking you're like oh wait it's this time they actually need their bottle instead of like if someone's busy having to ask around, it's just there that you can see and use as a reference throughout the day. I think that's really a useful strategy to have. I also used to do that in the baby room I worked in and that was so helpful, especially when you work with younger babies who aren't consistent within each other's routines. Like as they get older and toddlers and preschool, everyone's basically in the same routine. But for the super little ones, you kind of just got to follow their lead. So it was really helpful having that written down and we would also have it on a clipboard that everyone would just say when you're in different parts of the nursery you would have that information written down then when it came to the older children I know a lot of nurseries have sort of a vague rotor that you would follow but trying to avoid everyone doing everything at the same time so we always used to set it out that toddlers would go for lunch at like 12 o'clock for example and then preschool would go at half 12 just to try and like minimize everyone being in the dining room at one time I think having systems as well like systems for snack time or maybe a rotating snack and systems for changing your nappies to getting your nappies out at the start of the day and having them in a basket with uh, names on or something just different systems that work throughout the day to kind of help your routine flow actually staff rotors I've seen in a lot of settings so you always know that, uh, for example, X time, blah, blah is going to be doing the nappy changes. X time, blah, blah is going to go get snack ready. And that just really helps keep things flowing because you'll know that someone's not going to be in the room at that time or this is going to be the priority. And I find that the most useful thing because everyone's got a job, everyone's contributing and it should all be flowing like clockwork. We also like when it, in our preschool room, it's quite busy and we always have like free flow and like outdoor play during tea time. So they're not all in the room at once when tea's going on to make it a bit more calmer. So like they'll just come and shout and shout at the group of children and ask them to come in for tea and like so that it wasn't as chaotic in the room I think that works really well as as well that's a really good point we used to do that for sleep time with toddlers when you have the older ones that were just phasing out of sleep we would always try and co- like do an adult led activity at that time with the older ones usually if you could outside so you could it was a bit easier and quiet but that's a good shout too I think good communication so everyone knows what they're doing either having like your routine or your, your jobs up on a board or at least verbally being clear about what people are going to be doing at different times. So we had someone ask, what does reading look like for different ages? I'm struggling to plan for this as part of my apprenticeship. So what does reading look like for, I'm guessing they're talking about maybe in like the babies to preschool, because obviously in babies it's more sort of your communication and language, not as in like reading, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think this is something when I first started working in early years, I really struggled with as well, because you think of reading very much in the traditional sense and it's just like with every other skill that a child has you just strip it back bring it back to their basics so when you think of maths for example you know that babies and toddlers aren't going to be counting to 10 and doing addition so you start with understanding what a number is looking at what's more or less before you start actually being like one two three four five and you can just apply that same theory to reading it's like can they hold a book the right way do they understand that it goes from left to right are they at least even they can't read it yet obviously but are they following 
driving with their eyes in the right direction when you're reading a book and pointing I think that's really important I think with babies as well like thinking about the type of books you've got so like touch and feel books encouraging them to touch the books um and like lift flaps and lift the flaps and like playing games with books to kind of engage those babies as well for sure and say so, yeah, I think in the baby room um reading in a group can be quite hard I think it's a lot of like um one-on-one reading and reading with like one child I find that's a lot easier in the baby room compared to like obviously as you move through to toddler and uh, preschool you kind of do a lot of group time reading and reading a book all together whereas in the baby room especially with them really young ones I've never really thought to like well when they're a bit older we do sit down and do like a bit of like group reading but with them really young babies just sitting down with them with a book and a lift and flap book or a touch and feel like Hannah said that's like a really nice moment between you and them and you're like guiding them through the book and they might get involved and they can actually do the pages whereas it, in a bigger group situation they can't really get involved with all the lifting the flap and turning the pages when you've got all five babies and their hands trying to all reach out to you so I think in the baby room you have to tailor it a little bit what a nightmare <laughs> and then as they get older and you start looking more towards the toddler age I always, again they're still not technically reading but they're starting to show like a pleasure of a story so they're coming to you and they're asking you to read a story to them or if you're saying I'm doing a story time like more children will flock over to you they'll start picking a book they'll be repeating the books that they enjoy they'll be adding in their own actions like if you're doing like bear hunt for example they'll start joining in on some of the keywords and then as they develop into preschool you are looking for them to again not technically read a full sentence but I suppose with toddlers in preschool you want them to be able to describe what's happening in the images so you can link that to the text with preschool and reading the thing that I found to be most successful was we took our snack time away from the dining room and we had that sat on the floor together and used that while we were reading and I found that that really helped them engage more and it was like a quiet calming activity and that really developed the love of reading in preschool from my experience. I think having a nice reading area as well in your room like having a specific especially for older ones having a specific place they can go sit and just look at a book or having a nice range of books um, in a basket or on a bookshelf for them to have easy access to and always make sure that you change them so it's not the same stories that they've got in there all the time. That's such a good point Charlotte and I think when you're in the room day in day out you actually can really forget to like rotate the toys and the books like you might rotate the toys a bit more often but you forget about the books but if they've only got the same selection of like 10 to 20 books for six months that's so boring. Yeah I used to you need to make it interesting. I was going to say, we used to have a, we were quite lucky because we had like a, we used to call him the book man. He actually did have a name, but it was called the book man. And he used to bring children's books in for a business so parents could buy them. But we, they were really cheap. So we used to buy big bulks of books from him and then put them in the rooms. Like there used to like be like 30 odd books in this pack. So like I'd put about 10 out each couple of like weeks and then swap them and then I used to do it that way just so they had a nice variety of books all the time and I think another really nice idea is like making photo books as well for all the ages we've talked about um to be able to talk about familiar things or maybe a trip out that you've had that's a really nice idea yeah firm favorite with me is family photo books I first introduced it in my old setting and I noticed that my current setting they do it too I mean some of the children we have to hide their family books on an emotional day in the baby room because they will literally walk around and cry and look at it but just pointing at a picture of mum like <laughs> yeah so I want your rubbish comparison yeah so it can be like a bit of a tricky balance at times but especially in toddlers our toddlers used to love it they would sit there for hours on end just like talking about their family and recalling the experiences of the picture which is really nice and also in the toddler room as well we used to do a lot of um, activities that extended on the book so like tough trays or tabletop activities that we put out that are, like build on their learning from the book and encourage them to retell their story or add their own ideas to it so like a gruffalo we'd like maybe do some gruffalo painting or something and then they would start to retell the story or you could ask them open-ended questions about the book and see if they can remember and really build on that learning basically in early years it's not actually sitting there and reading a book out loud yeah. it's all these the skills that come before that so they can do that and it makes sense to them so another question that we got is when picking someone to be a room leader what type of factors and characteristics would you take into account We've all had experience of having good managers and having bad managers. So I think the most important thing for me personally is having a manager who communicates openly 
and is really collaborative. You don't want to work with a manager or like when I say manager, I'm obviously meaning room leader, but you don't want to work with a room leader who isn't willing to get stuck in and do everything because I think that forms a big divide. And then it's kind of like they're looking down on you like, oh, I don't change nappies. I'm the room leader. But like we should all be getting stuck in and doing the same job. This is we're all working towards the same goals for the children. So I think a room leader, it's really important for me that they want a collaborative group work, teamwork environment. I think you want someone with like a good level of experience generally, but also with maybe the age group they're going to be leading because as we've already discussed, all the age groups are so different. And I think it's really beneficial to have someone who's experienced working with babies or toddlers or preschool. Positivity as well, like someone who's quite upbeat. You've got to have a lot of energy to kind of motivate your team. Definitely. I think if you start with someone who's a bit kind of like not got that energy and passion about what they're doing, I think once they start doing a role, like a management role, that's a bit trickier, then it doesn't have a good impact on the team. Yeah, it seeps down, doesn't it? If yeah. someone's, if like someone in a leadership position is unhappy, it does lead down. I also really liked what you said, Hannah, about having experience in that age range. Like as a room leader, the job is pretty similar, but actually it does need to be tweaked for the age range. Like a baby room leader it needs to be so much more on it with the daily routines and understanding of each child not that a preschool room leader doesn't need to be but because the routines are more similar their focus would look be shifting on managing that balance between having the super young preschoolers who have just turned three to the ones that are just leaving for school and managing that appropriately within the room so the emphasis is you're right different and I went straight from baby room leader to preschool room leader myself And I don't feel like for the first couple of months, I was really much of a room leader in preschool because it was a whole new thing to get used to again. So I felt like we were a little bit leaderless for that time while I had to get my head around everything. So that is a really important skill, actually. I also think with room leaders, it's worth like asking them, like, what is their leadership style? I think it's really important to take into consideration, one, how they lead and like how they manage but also make them aware that they should be taking into account how every team member in that room likes to be managed um because say if a room leader likes to take more of a micromanaging approach one team member might quite like that and being told like you're doing this you're doing that that day but another team member probably won't like that and you have to take that into consideration and one thing I always think about what makes a good leader is someone who tailors like how they lead to each team member so I think it's definitely worth like when I don't know I'm guessing if this is like an interview or something like that taking into consideration them factors and characteristics that's a really good point actually Fliss because as a reader you should be able to trust your staff that they'll manage the day-to-day running of the room so you can focus on the overall staff side of things but you're right each person is so different and I think we forget that a lot with leadership it's Every, everybody is different everybody needs to be supported in different ways everyone likes to be told what to do in different ways like to have different amount of input in what's going on so it's really important to remember especially that. if you're new into that room and they were already a quite well established team and then you come in and you start saying do this do that like to them they're just going to be like whoa who are you like coming in and demanding this sort of thing you have to really think about your approach to certain things yeah good point I think as well you've got to be very good at accepting change and knowing that it's not always going to be the same staff, the same routine. Like obviously you get new things coming in from like government changes and stuff and things and new policies. And I think you've got to be very adaptable and change what you do on a daily basis sometimes as well. And not be so setting, you can't really be setting your ways and very, this is how we do it because obviously everything changes all the time and you get like you get new staff members in or you might get bank staff in and you know you get new children and not all children are the same they like different things so you have to be very open to changing things about and adapting to like new ways of working I think the other thing to remember which you've just reminded me of Charlotte is that actually a room leader is the middle position between being a general practitioner and a manager and that's a, it, that is a difficult line to be in because you need to be really supportive, friendly, collaborative with your room. But also you are responsible for ensuring that the policies, procedures, anything that's going on with the setting is followed and enforced. So it can be really tricky to manage that relationship with the people in your team between being like their best friend. You know what I mean? Super friendly or manager role. So you need to that's always a tricky thing as well. 
So another question we've had is, how did you cope with room change? I've been working with preschoolers for a long time, but I'm going to be moving into toddlers age one to two. Does anyone have any advice? I feel like when you're asked to move a room, it really depends on why. <laughs> if you've asked, you're buzzing for it. If you're being asked to move and you're super happy, it's a really like frustrating process. I always found that when I moved room, ideally you'd like to phase it if you can. Like you do a couple of afternoons one week, then a full day. But you don't always have that luxury in early years and you might literally just finish in one room on Friday evening, start in a new room on Monday, but you need to be flexible. And if you know that change is coming, just take half an hour to brush up on your knowledge of working with that age range, whether that's quickly talking to the toddler team and saying, can you just quickly run me through the day of your routine? Or like, can you tell me about this child? So you're not going in completely unprepared, I think is really important. I think we've just had this with, in my current setting, someone's moved from preschools into our baby room. And our baby room at the moment is very much very young babies. So they're around nine months. So it's a big change, but they, the setting, um, before she moved in, they sent her off on baby training um, to brush up her skills, even though she's already worked in babies before and done that, just that extra support moving into it and I guess like just ask the questions like she's been in the room now and like she was like oh I actually don't know how to make this child's bottle and like instead of that actually attempting to do it without the knowledge like it's better if you just ask someone in the room who knows it and it's quite a lot because when they're so young as well like you're probably a new face to them like what we found with these nine month year olds they're they've only just got used to the core practitioners but then like when new practitioners are coming in they can be really unsettled with with the new faces so it's just like supporting them to make them bonds with them children and helping them in the process and I guess like be make the other people in the room aware that you're not feeling totally comfortable so that they can be in a better position to support you I think if you go into it just thinking it'll all be all right and not open to actually asking questions or receiving support I think that's when it goes a bit a bit wrong then you probably won't enjoy it yeah change management is key isn't it you need to be supported throughout the process of the change to make sure it's successful if you just get checked into it it's just going to take even longer and then in the time of getting it into a good the change into a good place there's going to be lots of mistakes or lots of things that could have gone better which makes everyone's job more difficult in the long run really I think the other thing, not necessarily for the person moving rooms to do it, maybe management or the room leader, is making parents aware that you're who you are and that you're coming to the room and you're going to be part of that team. Because I, I know um, parents are often like, oh, so-and-so is in here today. And it's kind of like, oh, are they staying here? Are they moving? So I think if parents know what's going on, they're more likely to kind of not be OK with you being a part of a team. It's not like they can change it, but like it's, it's kind of that's what's happening. They like to know what's going on. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Hannah, because when I've done that before, I don't know if I have clearly communicated that to parents because you just think about the immediate things that are going to be happening. But you're right, like part of that change management is working with parents as well because you want the practitioner who's new to the room, they're going to need to make those relationships with parents and families and there are lots of ways that you can do that. Something we did at our setting quite recently um, because we've had a lot of new children and staff moving rooms, we did a um, parent meet and greet at the end of the day so like um they could come in after like all the children had gone it was only on for like half an hour or so but these parents if they wanted to could come into each room and we were kind of just like stood around and they could come and just chat to us and get to know us and like did you get many people go um there was actually quite a big turnout because a lot of babies are starting who have children already in preschool so like even though they already kind of knew the practitioners they would come and say hi and it was a bit weird because like literally some parents picked their child up like half an hour ago and then they turn back up <laughs> to come and say hi and we're like oh but you actually already know us but for me being a bank staff and relief member of staff who doesn't do handover that often it was actually quite nice for me to say like hey like I'm in this room sometimes at this time like that's probably like where you know me from but like they don't actually know that I'm not there all day so it's quite nice to actually give them a bit of background and make them feel comfortable when they're turning up to pick their child off or or drop them off that they actually know who everyone in the room is that's a that's a really nice thing yeah like any kind of parents evening that nurseries used to do I hated like it's great sharing information about the children but just like as a person (laughs) I'm like this I'm done yeah it was all new to me because my old setting did nothing like that and then this setting does quite a lot of like parent engagement sort of stuff and it's yeah new territory but it it went really well 
Good, I'm pleased. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Twinkle Talks EYFS. As always, you can find us on a variety of social media channels, including Facebook, Instagram, X, YouTube, Pinterest. If it exists, we're probably on it. And in the meantime, we'll speak to you in a few weeks. Bye. 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 So that's it for today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. If you would like to join in or would like to know more, then come and find us on our social media sites. We have a Facebook page, Facebook groups, an Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Pinterest, and YouTube. All the links of where to find us will be in our podcast description. Come and join the conversation. And whatever you're doing today, I hope you have a great day.